So there was a young lady in 1930 in Ireland. Her name was Lena O'Malley. And Lena graduated from high school and decided that she wanted to go across the pond to the Americas and discover that big city called New York. And so that's what she did. She left her safe little community in Ireland and moved to New York City. And there she became, she found her gift, she found her talent, which was being an acrobat. And so she became a very famous acrobat in show business. Several years had passed and she decided she was getting lonesome and homesick for her family in Ireland, so she decided to go home. And of course, since she went home, she had grown up in her Catholic church and she figured she probably go to, should go to confessional. Maybe hadn't been for a while. So she decided to go see uh, Father uh, Sullivan to, to go to confessional. So she's in the confessional and she sits down and Father Sullivan recognizes her voice immediately. And so he says, oh, Lena, it's so good to hear from you and to hear you tell me before we do confessional, tell me what are you doing in New York? She said, well, Father Sullivan, I'm an, I'm an acrobat in show business. And he said, acrobat? I don't, I don't even know what, what is an acrobat? She said, well, if you want me to, I'll show you. So he says, yes. So out she comes out of the confessional and right there in front, right there at the front of the church, she's doing flips and handstands and cartwheels and splits and all the things she does. For So Father Sullivan can see what she does as, a, as an acrobat. And don't you know, there are two little old ladies sitting there in the pews waiting for their confessional. And one of them says, oh, me. I'm not very good with an Irish brogue, but <laughs> look at the penance that Father uh, <laughs> Sullivan is handing out today. And today, me without my bloomers on. <laughs> now that is bad luck, right? <laughs> not to wear your bloomers on that particular day is bad luck. I love that story. This month, this whole month, we've been talking about luck. And remember, I'm putting that in air quotes, right? Because we do not believe in the idea of luck, although a lot of the world does. But we're looking at what, what is luck and how do we become luckier, which really means how do we align ourselves more clearly with spiritual principle and the divine law that is always operating for us to bring about a life of joy and peace and connection and harmony and prosperity and love and meaning. How do we increase our luck? And so we've taken a book that was uh, based on 10 years of research by Dr. Richard Weissman in England, who uh, wrote a book then called The Luck Factor, Four Principles to Increase Your Luck and Enhance Your Life. And we're looking at those four principles, one each Sunday. Today we're going to look at a, th a third principle in the series of four. But before we do, I need to back up and do two, want to do two things. Number one, last Sunday you had an assignment. Remember, you got an assignment. Who remembers that you had an assignment? I'm not even asking you if you remember what it was or did it, but do you remember that you had one? <laughs> Good. Uh, I'm saying like maybe a dozen of you. Eh, you know, I'll take it. I will take it. All right, so the assignment was what, those of you who remember? To look at, because lucky people maximize their opportunities. They look for them and they act upon them. So your mission, should you have chosen to accept it, was to look for two opportunities in the week and act on them. So how many looked and acted? Oh, more looked who remembered. That's good. I like that. That's mo Give yourselves a hand for that. I want to <laughs> honor you and appreciate you. And it's never too late, those of you who didn't. But if you did this week look and act upon two, e I'll take one even, opportunities, after service, come up to this pot of gold. We have a pot of gold up here. I have you noticed the pot of gold? It's filled with gold, coins, which is actually better than gold. Mm -hmm, yeah, it's chocolate, of course, chocolate. I, we have a, I had a little girl in first service come up after with one, and she goes, you know what? This is better than real gold. <laughs> so, so come up and get one of those. The other thing that I want to do before we get into our idea for the day is that yesterday was St. Patrick's Day, and this whole theme actually for the month has been inspired by pa St. Patrick's Day. And I just want to give you a, a trivia, and I have a trivia question for you about St. Patrick's Day. So St. Patrick's Day is always on the 17th of March, and it is to commemorate the believed death date of one of the patron saints of Ireland, St. Patrick, and also to commemorate the arrival of Christianity in Ireland. 
it's celebrated with parades and fanfare and people wearing clovers and wearing green and consuming a lot of alcohol. <laughs> That's part of the St. Patrick's Day thing. Does anybody know why that is associated with St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> you don't tell me if you were in first service, it doesn't count. Okay, I'm about to tell you, I find this fascinating. So St. Patrick's Day, again, follow, falls on March 17th. Well, March 17th falls in, in a 40-day period. What is the 40-day period that it falls in? It falls in Lent. Well, in, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> the church decided to lift the ban on drinking alcohol on St. Patrick's Day. So for one day of Lent, people could drink, and boy, did they take advantage of it. <laughs> And I think that tradition, more than any others, at least in America, caught on. I don't go for <laughs> I'm just saying. Where the tradition of green beer came in, I don't even know how that happened. But the tradition of wearing green also is part of St. Patrick's Day. And I told you, if you wore green today, there would be a gift. Your gift is a gold coin. So after service, if you have green on, darn, um, if you have green on, come get a coin or two. There's a lot here we don't want don't want any left, so come get a coin. Or if you just desperately want chocolate and you sneak up here, nobody is going to care. You just come on. <laughs> you come on up and get yourself a piece of a gold coin at the pot of gold, okay? All right. So for... <laughs> oh, he's not even going to wait. Look at that. He's not even going to wait. Four principles of that lucky people, people who have good luck, four principles they live by. They're amazing because they align perfectly, of course, with our beautiful science of mind teachings. The, the one we're going to look today is that lucky people, people who experience good luck in their lives, turn their bad luck into good luck. They turn their bad luck into good luck. Sometimes, however, we may feel like Calvin. Now, I don't mean Calvin who started a religion, and I don't mean, oh, you're so good. Yes, that Calvin. I was going to say, I don't mean Calvin, the former president. I mean Calvin of Calvin and Hobbes. Do you know who that is? Anybody not know who that is? Calvin and Hobbes is a precious, hysterically funny, sweet cartoon um, penned, created by Bill Watterson. They're books of Calvin and Hobbes cartoons. They're hysterical and sweet. Calvin is this little precocious eight-year-old and his stuffed tiger Hobbes who comes to life whenever they're alone. So one day Calvin says to Hobbes, you know Hobbes, some days even my lucky rocket ship underpants don't help. <laughs> I have an underwear thing going today and I'm not really quite sure <laughs> why that is, but I, I'm not even going to comment on what that's about. I don't even know. But sometimes we feel like if we don't, you know, have the stars aligned, you know, it, we're not going to be lucky. The deal is there is no such thing, uh, there's no power in a pair of lucky rocket ship underpants. There is no power in any other good luck charm. But today, we are going to look at three principles under this idea that lucky people change their bad luck to good, three ways of being. And, and then I'm going to give you your own personalized lucky charm, all right? Your own lucky charm that's not out there, <laughs> but it's in here. In Japan, there is a very famous uh, prolific, if you will, lucky charm, and it's called a Daruma doll. I don't know if you have ever heard of this, but a Daruma doll is a little figure about, well, it can be different sizes, but about that big, and it's, it's very, it's an egg shape, wide on the bottom. You can push it over, and it'll flop back up. It is named after a Buddhist monk who, the legend says, meditated for so long that his arms and his legs disappeared. So the Daruma doll is a depiction of this Buddhist meditating, but he's so s anchored and so solid that you knock him over and he'll pop back up. So this morning I'm going to give you your own Daruma doll <laughs> internal practice. Uh, but first I want to look at three aspects, three ways that lucky people turn their bad luck into good. And the first one is... <coughs> that they see the positive side of their bad luck. 
they see the positive side of their bad luck. In 1995, there was a woman interviewed in a Tel Aviv hospital. She was 35 years old. She had just her survived her second bus bombing attack. And she was interviewed by a Tel Aviv newspaper and an article, she was quoted in the article as having said, I have no luck or I have all the luck. I'm not sure which it is. I have no luck or I have all the luck. I have no luck because I've been bombed two times in the course of a year. Or I have all the luck because I survived the bombing two times. I don't know which it is. That statement caught the eye of a researcher from the University of Oslo, a Carl Teagan. And he had been researching luck. Along, Dr. Weissman, the author of the book we're using, was doing one research. He, the, Dr. Uh, Teagan was doing another one in, in um, Oslo. And he s that really sp spurred him to look at what, what is, what's the difference between people who think they're lucky and think they're not. And he and his research team, which consisted of psychologists and even economic e economists and statisticians, came up with a term called counter counterfactual alternative. <laughs> that people who consider themselves lucky have a counter alternative, are imagining a counterfactual alternative. Now, what does that mean? It means that the person who says, oh no, why did this happen to me? is comparing themselves to people to whom that unfortunate thing did not happen. Uh, why me? Why not you? Why me? Why not them? Why did that happen to me? Woe is me. Why me? And those of you who have studied the four levels of consciousness, right, you might recognize the why me, by me, through me, as me. We've talked about that a lot here. Why me is like the first level of consciousness. It's victim consciousness. Why did this happen to me? You know, it has Velcro on your hand and your he hand goes like this. <laughs> why me? People who, who look at a situation and say, why me, are the ones who have lousy luck and they've measured their lives. But the people who look at it and say, thank you, oh my goodness, they compare it to what could have been those are the people who have lucky lives. And I love this, Tegan, the um, researcher said this, both are valid interpretations of an event. You can look at it either way. But the second one helps you hold on to optimism, to feel the emotion of, what do you think? Gratitude and to weave a narrative in which you are the lucky protagonist of your own life. So science has shown that. What do our spiritual principles teach? Our spiritual principles teach that what we focus on, where we send our attention, we enlarge, we expand. And to go deeper in that, when we send our attention and when we see God in the middle of everything, then we transmute and transform not only ourselves, but the condition and the situation. I love a passage from our textbook that I memorized years and years ago to use as part of my meditation. It's on page 185. And it says, perfect God within me, perfect life within me. So hold on, I have to be in my meditation to get it. Perfect God within me, perfect life within me. Come, perfect life within me, which is God. Come through me as that which I am. Lead me ever into paths of perfection and cause me to see only the good. Cause me to see only, not some, not good in some situations and not in others, but to see only the good. And because of the setup of that, the good is seeing God in everything. So people who are lucky see the good, even in those unlucky situations. So I love making these things personal to us. So I just want to very quickly have you think, you don't have to say you know, is there a situation in your life right now that you might call unlucky? You, it's an ill fortune. It's too bad. It's, you're not happy about it. Can you right this moment see a positive aspect to it? And if you're like, no, mm -mm, cannot do it, don't see it, well, then I invite you to consciously choose to see God in the middle of it. And then that positive dimension of it will pop out into your conscious awareness. I know it. 
So that's the first thing that people who turn their bad luck into good do. The second thing they do, I want to introduce by a story. It's the story of two monks who had taken a vow of celibacy, not allowed to, you know, engage in human activities of sorts. <laughs> and they're walking along a river and, and need to cross this river. And, and as they're walking along, getting ready to cross, a woman, beautifully dressed, elegantly dressed, obviously um, beautifully expensive clothing, uh, she walks up and she needs to cross the river as well. One of the monks, not wanting her to soil her beautiful clothing, he picks her up and he carries her gently and lovingly across the river and he puts her on the other side. And then the other, the other monk walks across too. The woman goes her way, the two monks go their way, and they walk on in silence for hours, hours. And finally, the monk who didn't carry the woman across said to the other monk, all right, I, I can't stand it anymore. I cannot hold it in any longer. I have to say, you know, you violated your vows when you picked up that woman. You are not supposed to even touch a woman. How could you possibly, possibly do that and think that that thing would be okay? And the first monk looked at his colleague and he said, you know, I let her go hours ago. Why can't you? <laughs> the second thing that people do who turn their bad luck into good is they do not dwell or hang on to their misfortunes. A misfortune may happen. A life's experience may happen, but they're not hanging on to it. Again, I ask you to think, is there something uh, for you that you're sort of hanging on to still? You replay it in your mind. You wish it had been different. It wasn't fair. How dare they? All that business. People who have experienced good luck, hmm, don't hang on. I love, I, I've got a lot of stories for you today. I love this, the true story of the um, composer, the Italian composer Rossini. And decades, decades, century ago, over a century ago, he, he's written many, 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 many things and one very famous opera, and even if you're not an opera fan, you may recognize the name of this, is called The Barber of Seville. So I see a lot of head shaking. Yes, you've heard of the, it's played, it's, it's performed today, a hundred plus years since he wrote it. Well, the first time it was performed, the very first time it was performed, it was a disaster. It was a fiasco. The, the audience booed and hissed at it when it was over. The diva was in tears, and the, the lead tenor was, you know, threatening suicide, and the director, everyone was just like, oh, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. And they try to find Rossini to see how he's doing after, and they can't find him anywhere in the opera house. He's nowhere in the theater. They don't know where he is. They look here, they look there. Finally, they decide to go home. This is a true story. They, they go home to see if they can find him. And they find him asleep in bed. <laughs> like, what? So they wake him up, and they're like, maestro, maestro, are you okay? What do you mean, am I okay? Are you okay? I mean, this was such a disaster. Everything was so awful. It's a disaster. Are you okay? He said, yes, I'm sleeping. Well, don't you care about the, the horrible ha thing that happened tonight? He said, clearly. The barber of Seville is not good enough. I need to work on it, but I'm going to get a good night's sleep first and do it tomorrow. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. And he did get up the next morning, rework it, and today it's still an opera, as I said before, that is being performed. So lucky people do not hang on to their bad luck situations. I love this quote from our founder, Ernest Holmes, in a book called Thoughts Are Things. He says, as you learn to release all your burdens to the right action of God, you will find that everything falls into its proper place. You let your problems slip away from you, realizing that a power greater than you are and a presence that is within you is ready, willing, and able to guide you in all ways. Let it go. Let it go. Oh, there should be a song, Let It Go. I think there is. It's a great song. <laughs> Yeah, frozen, right? Third idea, third way that people who turn their bad luck into good show up in life. And that it's related to the first one, but it goes even deeper than the first one, which is seeing a positive out of the bad luck. This one is people who experience good luck are convinced, and I, I want to underscore that word, are convinced that any misfortune in their lives in the long run will be for the best. Any misfortune, they are convinced that any misfortune in their lives in the long run 
will be for the best. You know, there's a saying that says, it is all good in the end. And so if it isn't good, it isn't the end. Mm -hmm, I love that. There's more to be revealed. Now, I know when we're standing in the middle of it, it's sometimes hard to see that. But that is the spiritual truth. And nothing speaks to that spiritual truth better than the scripture at Romans 8, 28. You, many of you know this. It says, as, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. So, if it isn't good, it isn't the end. To recap, people who turn bad luck into good see the positive side, they don't hang on to their misfortune, and they are convinced, meaning they know, they know that they know, that in the end, that down the road, somewhere along the line, this thing that looks so icky today is for their highest good. And how many of us can think back to something that seemed so awful and painful and yucky and it was done to us and we had blah, 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 and now we look back and go, oh, thank you, life, that that happened. Anybody be able to do that? Thank you. We know that we have experience of that. Remember that when you're going through something. So I promised I would give you your own lucky charm today, that I would give you a tool that is more powerful than having a Daruma doll in front of you, uh, than having a, a rabbit's foot or a uh, clover or a, uh, what are some other things, a horseshoe or your fuzzy dice hanging in the wind, you know, much more powerful than any of those things. But it will help you be like that doll. It will help you be like the door jam. Remember the door jam analogy that I gave on our first Sunday that we were together where we talked about when we anchor and really live our spiritual principles, we are like the door jam. That is, what is it? It is vertical, it is solid, and it doesn't move even though the door may swing open and closed. It may violently swing open. It will violently slam shut. No matter what happens, that door jam is just a solid pillar and that's what we can be. We may get slammed around, we may get knocked around, but we can remain a solid pillar. I want to give you a practice, a spiritual practice, that actually I have learned and been using now for the past year and a half through some work that I've done called the Art of Feminine Presence. Now, guys, those who don't resonate with feminine energy, don't go running out the room because you can do this too. It's just there's a slight tweak, a slight difference between I'm just going to say those who resonate with feminine energy and those who resonate with masculine energy because it's not necessarily a gender thing. It just depends on who you are. But if you resonate with feminine, there'll be one slight difference than if you resonate with masculine. It is a way to absolutely cause you to be solid and, and, and firm. So I'm going to ex explain it quickly and then we'll actually do it. Those of you who have done the Art of Feminine Presence work with me, you will recognize this. There are three energetic centers. Well, there's... In this view, there, there are three energetic centers we're going to focus on. Physical locations in our body that are energetic centers. One of them is, is here, but not here. In behind the third eye, but back in the, like the middle of the head. So in the middle place of your head is our first energetic center. And it has the frequency of knowledge, intelligence, and wisdom. Divine wisdom. That's the frequency that lives in that center. The next one is heart. Our heart has a frequency, has an energy. Our heart has the energy of love, but we're going to put three words to that. Care, compassion, and kindness. Our heart is the energy of care, compassion, and kindness. And then I have always, always for years... When I think about the energetic place in my body where God lives, I know God lives in me and as me and through me, totally as me, but if there's a concentrated center point of that, I have always thought it was right here. I've always, like in my diaphragm, that's where I felt it. What I've learned is there's a, an oriental um, view of that center point, that anchor point, that root of life point in us, and it's called Dantien. Those of you who do yoga or shigong, uh, martial arts, you may know of Dantien. That's your anchored place. 
And so for women that are not women, but for those who resonate with, fem with feminine energy, that place is about three inches below your navel and back toward your spine. So those of you who resonate with that, that's where it is. That's your energetic center. If you, if you resonate with masculine energy, it's just a little bit higher. It's like an inch below your navel, but also back. That's the only difference. It's still in the same area. And this area is the center point of our creativity, of our intuition, and of our spiritual power. So we got creativity, intuition, spiritual power. We've got l care, kindness, and compassion. We have intelligence, knowledge, and wisdom. When we line all those up, we call this vertical core alignment. When we line these up, oh baby, you're not going to get knocked very far. You're going to come right back. So I want you to close your eyes. And Paul's going to play for me some vertical core alignment music. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to start at the base. We're going to start at that place of Dantian that seat of intuition, creativity, spiritual power. And I want you to envision that place in you, physically in you. And I want you to see this ball of light being formed in that place in you. And that ball of light is pulsating with energy and aliveness. And you feel the connection to your creative source you feel the connection to your intuitive knowings and you feel the connection to your spiritual power you are anchored you are grounded in that right now and then i want you to take a strand a cord of that light keep the light glowing there but i want you to bring a cord up to your heart Bring it up vertically to your heart center and have it expand into a burst of light in your heart center. And so you have this burst of light at Dantien, and now you have a cord that's taking you up to your heart and a burst of light in your heart. And that burst of light is pulsating with a frequency of kindness and of care and of compassion for yourself, for others, for life, for all life. So both of these centers, you now feel them pulsating with the frequency of those qualities and attributes. And this is a practice that needs to be practiced. So if you can't hold on to both of those as I send you up to your head, that's okay. Practice it, work with this, and you will be able to. But for now, I want you to take a cord of light from your heart and take it up to your head doing your best to keeping Dantian and heart pulsating. But now we go to the head, that center point inside your head, and you see it filled with light. It's filled with light. And that light is pulsating with a frequency of intelligence and knowledge and divine wisdom. And if you were to step away now out of your body and look back at you, you see these three pulsating centers of light connected by this vertical cord of light, and you are aligned. You are aligned. That is your lucky charm right there. You stay in that alignment, and you are the door jam. You are the Daruma doll. So we breathe into this space. We deepen into this space. We open for this space to live and move and have its being as us. And as we do, we just better get ready. We just better get ready for a life that is rich and full and sweet and joy-filled. And for this, I am grateful. And so it is.